12 o'clock. Let me make sure we're recording. We are recording. So uh, let me welcome you first from the home offices from the California Contract Cities, which is literally my home office at my home. Uh, thank you for joining us. Unfortunately, a pandemic has extended into 2021 with hope on the horizon. We're not quite where we need to be yet to meet in person with uh, some very important folks up in Sacramento, but we're hopeful that uh, at some point later this year, we're going to all be able to meet in person again and we'll resume some normalcy uh, as we move past the pandemic. So thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to join us. Uh, I'm going to um, give you a quick welcome. As I said, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. We're going to be doing this over the next four weeks. You all should have received notices for every week, the last, the next three weeks, starting next week, we had to move our meetings to um, uh, to Thursdays because there's caucus meetings on the assembly, on the assembly and the Senate side for both Republicans and Democrats at noon on Tuesdays. So that was a standing meeting that was created sometime early last week. We had already been uh, in the planning uh, phase for this, so we made a quick, uh, quick adjustment, uh, and we've already confirmed Speaker Rendon for next week. So please be sure to join us because I'm sure that's going to be an incredibly informative conversation with him. So with no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you and present to you all someone who is well known by you all, our president, Lindsay Horvath. Thank you so much, Marcel, and thank you to your entire team uh, for all of the work that you've done to make this virtual legislative tour possible. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to be with everyone. And while I'm sad that we continue to have to practice social distancing, I'm grateful that we have this technology to bring us together and start off the year together um, and doing all of the work that we will do together. Um, it's uh, there's a lot ahead of us. I know that we've just gotten out of a very challenging year. We're not quite in the clear yet, um, but we will continue forward. And I know that Contract Cities has provided um, a, a wide variety of uh, supports for our for our various cities uh, to navigate this very difficult time. And I want to thank all of you for participating, for sharing your best practices, for being engaged and uh, for all the work that you're doing to keep your residents safe, your businesses uh, up and running if possible, and uh, to keep your communities um, stable as much as possible. I'm very excited about our guest speaker today, and I want to thank uh, Betty so much for uh, joining us. I know uh, that she'll be introduced shortly, but uh, she's one of my sheroes up in Sacramento, and I'm just so grateful that she's made time for us. Um, I First, want to introduce though our our local Shiro uh, here for this uh, for this tour on our board and leading our legislative efforts this year, uh, uh, Councilmember Stacy Armato, who is our legislative chair. She has uh, led our legislative committee uh, fearlessly and flawlessly uh, to work very hard to make sure that the interests that we have as local government in Sacramento are well represented, uh, that we're taking action on the things that our communities need. Uh, that we're protecting our cities as we need it, and uh, that we're upholding all of the values that people uh, have come to appreciate about Contract Cities Association, and uh, to make sure that we're doing our part uh, to protect all of our cities. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, our, ch our legislative chair, Stacey Armato. Well, thank you very much, Madam President, and thank you everyone for being with us today. I wanted to welcome California State Controller Betty Yi. Ms. Yi was elected to her position in November 2019, excuse me, 2014, following two terms of service on the California Board of Equalization. As controller, she continues to serve the board as its fifth voting member. Reelected for a second term as controller in 2018, Ms. Yi is only the 10th woman in California history to be elected to statewide office. As the state's chief fiscal officer, Ms. Yee chairs the Franchise Tax Board and serves as a member of the California Public Employees Retirement System and the California State Teachers Retirement System Boards. These two boards have a combined portfolio of more than $620 billion. Ms. Yee also serves on the Saris Board of Directors, a nonprofit organization working to mobilize many of the world's largest investors to advance global sustainability and to take stronger action on climate change. Ms. Yee serves on dozens of boards and commissions with authority ranging from land management to crime victim compensation. 
As a member of the State Lands Commission and chairperson in even numbered years, she helps provide stewardship of public trust lands, waterways, marine terminals, pipelines, and resources through economic development, protection, preservation, and restoration consistent with the state's environmental needs. Through other financing authorities, Ms. Yee is dedicated to creating incentives to increase the number of affordable housing units, spur economic development, support pollution control innovations, and strengthen health and educational facilities. Ms. Yee has more than 35 years of experience in public service, specializing in state and local finance and tax policy. She previously served as the Chief Deputy Director for Budget within the California Department of Finance, where she led the development of the governor's budget, negotiations with the legislature and key budget stakeholders, and fiscal analyses of legislation. Prior to this, she served in senior staff positions for several fiscal and policy committees in both houses of the California State Legislature. She also co-founded the Asian Pacific Youth Leadership Project, which exposes California high school youth to the public service sector, public policy, and public political arenas. A native of San Francisco, Ms. Yi received her bachelor's degree from, in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley, and holds a master's degree in public administration. Thank you, Ms. Lee, for being with us today. I'll hand the floor over to you. Oh, You're muted. I was worried about that, yeah. <laughs> Still hard to hear you. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Okay. Ah, I'm much more of a tech geek than I thought. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stacy, for the introduction and for the invitation. And um, Always good to see my friend, uh, uh, Mayor Horvath um, from West Hollywood and so many friends among the Contract City family. And um, you know, these are extraordinary times and I'm uh, grateful to be meeting in this forum if for nothing else but to connect and reconnect and to be sure that uh, we are uh, lending your voices to what we need to do at the state level to get to the other side of this pandemic and also to re rebuild our economy, uh, hopefully in a more resilient way as we uh, climb out of this recession. Uh, first, I hope everyone is doing well and uh, this finds you and your family and loved ones healthy and safe. And uh, also um, just wanna say to all of you, thank you for continuing to serve in your capacities. I think I've um, been thinking a lot in this uh, past week as we, um, I think for many of us, the images of what happened in our nation's capital last week continue to be etched in our minds. And uh, I personally felt that it was such an assault on our institutions of government and our democracy. And I think this is a time when all of us just feel just um, in, in a multitude of ways, uh, just so committed to delivering what uh, is expected of us during this uh, emergency time and during this crisis time. And so um, I hope all of you are, are, are feeling safe in your respective jurisdictions. Um, what I wanted to do today, because it's been a while since we've met in person, is um, to talk about just um, the uh, state of things in California, uh, and uh, certainly from an economic perspective, which is where I place most of my uh, attention, as well as uh, the recently released governor's budget and what that portends, and, um, and then talk about um, hopefully some bright spots with respect to uh, this coming year uh, as well. Uh, I, as I look at uh, just what we've had to do uh, during this pandemic, I know all of you have not skipped a beat in terms of the vital services that are still expected to be provided uh, by cities, obviously for contract cities, uh, a lot of that is dependent on uh, so many of our other jurisdictions and the health of uh, of, of, their, um, of those levels of government as well. Uh, but it is a time when I know that uh, when we look at the effects of the pandemic, it is really at the local level. And it's not lost on me that uh, all of a sudden local governments have become a, a political thing in terms of uh, any kind of COVID relief back in Washington, that this is where the rubber meets the road is really at the local level. You see it on your main streets. You see it in terms of people who are feeling uh, the pressures of, of uh, evictions and 
uh, just all of the challenges that this time has brought, uh, not just from COVID-19, but also from the pandemic-induced recession. And so, you know, really, these are uncertain times. These are unprecedented times. And unfortunately, that uncertainty is going to be with us for a bit uh, longer. And, uh, you know, if I look at what's happening around the nation, uh, it is, it does tell the story. Uh, and California, in some respects, um, testified some of these uh, uh, features in terms of what's happening with the economy nationally. We saw the US GDP declined uh, at an annualized rate of 32.9% as the lockdowns took effect in the second quarter of 2020. And uh, since the US began keeping records uh, shortly after World War II, uh, GDP has never dropped more than 10% on an annualized basis in any quarter. So this was just really quite stark and uh, is something that uh, I know um, forecasters are gonna keep a watchful eye over. Uh, the economy did see some bright spots uh, in the third quarter of 2020, and that's um, mainly because of the effective federal stimulus spending and a surge in consumer activity, uh, which actually was responsible for 68% of the GDP. So as uh, many were uh, being ordered to shelter in place um, for many of the workforce to uh, be um, engaged in remote work, uh, we saw actually consumer spending uh, increasing and um, that, uh, did, uh, that was a, a bright spot for, uh, for the economy. Uh, the U.S. Commerce Department uh, announced in late October that the GDP accelerated at an annualized rate of 33.1% in the third quarter of 2020. So um, still, uh, personal income fell 13.2% over this time. And that's a trend that's likely to hamper future growth. Uh, we also see many of our think tanks uh, also uh, issuing their prognostications, but the Brookings Institute cautions that the economy is still in a hole. It is slowing. And that third quarter growth uh, was a percentage of a greatly diminished second quarter uh, base. So uh, in terms of a year over year raw change, the economy contracted 9% in the second quarter and 2.9% in the third quarter. And while these numbers appear dire, uh, we have seen an improving employment picture. And uh, you know, when I look at uh, the jobs picture uh, nationally in uh, November, there were 245,000 jobs that were created and the unemployment rate actually dropped to 6.7%, uh, according to the US Department of Labor on the latest uh, employment figures. Uh, for the state, uh, according to the latest numbers released by the Employment Development Department, uh, California's unemployment rate dropped from 9% to 8.2% in November as employers added about 57, a little over 57,000 jobs. And the uh, November uh, total non-farm uh, employment stood at about 16 point, almost 16.2 million. And so these numbers are heartening. You know, when you look at it on the surface, uh, it is still about 1.3 million jobs below the November 2019 mark. Um, so about a 7.6% decrease. But from March 1st through December 26, um, EDD has processed nearly 16.5 million unemployment claims. And this includes more than 3.8 million claims for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. We've paid out about $111 billion in benefits since March. That's nearly five times the total of all that was paid out in 2010, the worst year of the Great Recession. And while these numbers are um, you know, dismal, um, on the one hand, uh, we, have, uh, we, we would expect to see a decrease in the state revenues coming into our coffers. And uh, indeed, uh, California's last state budget assumed a $41 billion um, uh, amount of lost revenues. And, but fortunately, the tax numbers actually um, paint a different picture and, uh, actually, uh, and probably explains why uh, this recovery is likely to be challenging. Uh, the big three revenues that the state receives, the uh, personal income tax, the corporation tax, and the sales tax, all exceeded budget projections, both for the month of December and the fiscal year to date. Uh, corporation tax receipts for December were about $3.3 billion uh, higher than anticipated. Uh, it's about a difference of 22.1%. And for the fiscal year to date, corporate tax receipts um, have uh, outpaced uh, estimates by about 13.8%. So really robust uh, uh, corporate corporation uh, corporate activity. Uh, retail sales and use tax uh, receipts uh, were about uh, $1.18 billion higher than anticipated in December. Uh, it's a difference of about 69.6%. And for the first half of the fiscal year, sales tax receipts uh, uh, topped estimates by almost 21%. So just uh, really uh, coming in robustly. 
and personal income tax revenues, which make up approximately 70% of the state general fund, uh, were so it's nearly uh, $52.5 billion more uh, than the 10.4 billion above budget estimates. So this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, unanticipated revenue on the personal income tax side. We close out the month of December with unused borrowable resources of about $48 billion. And that's important because um, even during this uh, time when we are in a recession, uh, we will not have to, we likely, uh, more than likely, will not have to go out to the market to borrow uh, to pay the bills for the state of California. So no external borrowing on the horizon. And this uh, is uh, that was also the case when we closed out the uh, fiscal year uh, last year uh, because we had actually entered the pandemic with very robust uh, reserves. We had a fully funded rainy day fund. We had uh, significant budget reserves that we could draw from. Uh, the governor was actually able to obtain a um, major presidential um, declaration, emergency declaration that began uh, the flow of FEMA funds to help with the early days of the pandemic response. And so we actually, California was on, on fairly strong uh, financial footing when the pandemic started. So all of these numbers would suggest that things are quite rosy, that in fact, uh, we are not out of the woods. Um, for one thing, we know that our income tax is very progressive in California. Um, these revenues only indicate that our uh, higher earning Californians uh, dodge the worst impacts of the pandemic. And I'm sure in uh, many of your communities and really what I see throughout the state is that for uh, many uh, workers uh, whose livelihoods have actually been uh, lost and, uh, and uh, some whose livelihoods are uh, still continuing but at greater risk of contracting the uh, coronavirus as they uh, do um, go to work. Uh, this is um, something that uh, is the tale of two cities that we see the stock market performing well, which helps our upper income earners, uh, those who rely on capital gains income. And yet for the rest of California, uh, we do see a lot of struggle, a lot of jobs lost, and uh, really particularly in our service sectors where many of our low wage workers are, are really suffering the worst of the, the pandemic. Our legislative analyst office, uh, which provides the legislature and nonpartisan fiscal expertise, uh, recently warned that California's current revenue what they call windfall, I would not call it a windfall, uh, will be followed by lean years ahead. And uh, that our recent economic projections uh, do give us some cause for optimism. So while there will be a budget deficit uh, in the year following this next uh, budget year in 2022-23, uh, those deficits will be smaller in nature. And right now they're projected to be about uh, $7.6 billion in the year after this uh, coming budget year. You know, with respect to some of the uh, forecasts, uh, the UCLA Anderson forecast, uh, which predicts state and national uh, economic trends, anticipates that the national GDP will grow by 1.8% in the first quarter of 2021 and 6% in the second quarter of 2021. And uh, the authors of that forecast uh, predict that California's recovery will begin uh, sluggishly, but eventually outpace the rest of the country. And a similar pattern occurred after the Great Recession a decade ago. And much of that can be attributed to the uh, diversity of our economy here in California, that uh, not one sector is completely relied upon with respect to our economic strength. And so uh, we do think that California is better poised with respect to uh, once it recovers to be able to sustain that recovery. The UCLA forecast also expects that the state's average unemployment rate uh, to reach about 6.9% in 2021 uh, followed by 5.2% in 2022 and 4.4% in 2023, pretty near the pre-pandemic levels. And so, um, and this was really a recognition of the vaccine and uh, hoping to uh, have our businesses and our economy uh, opening up in a more, a more sustained way uh, during this period of time. Uh, and just for context, it took uh, nearly seven years for California to fully recover from the, uh, the job losses of the Great Recession. So um, that was a very protracted uh, downturn and recession. And uh, to regain all of those jobs uh, took uh, the course of about seven years. So while these projections are hopeful, um, I think it's important to note um, that they assume widespread availability of the COVID-19 vaccines in the coming months. We are reading headlines about uh, large venues being open to uh, be able to uh, administer the vaccine, particularly first and foremost to our frontline healthcare workers. And, uh, but so far we've seen distribution really be quite a challenge. Um, and also uh, reading more about how uh, many of our fellow Californians are actually rejecting the vaccine. And so uh, those are all issues that are going to need to be addressed in terms of our ability to uh, safely reopen the economy. 
So um, I'm glad to see the governor uh, is um, proposing a budget that includes $300 million to improve vaccine distri distribution. Um, and as I said, we're looking at large venues to begin to open in order to do that. And uh, I wanna just take a moment to highlight some of the other aspects of the governor's budget, because I think this is important in terms of uh, his call for the legislature to act quickly on a number of his proposals uh, so that we can uh, hopefully get um, the pandemic under control, that we can think about uh, supporting small businesses to be able to reopen and to provide other financial assistance as well. So the... Um, Items of note uh, in the governor's budget that was released last Friday. Uh, one is the Golden State Stimulus, and this provides uh, $600 of uh, rapid cash support directly uh, to support about 4 million Californians um, who coupled with the federal stimulus could receive about uh, $1,200 of direct relief. And um, the 4 million Californians who would be receiving the Golden State Stimulus are uh, those who have received the California Earned Income Tax Credit these are low-income working Californians in each of our, in each of our uh, communities. And uh, I know there will be a lot of legislative debate around this issue. Uh, the assembly held its first um, uh, budget hearing yesterday, and already there have been uh, some uh, uh, concerns raised about whether this is the population uh, to assist uh, because they are working, um, low-income working families, or whether uh, more should be done in terms of uh, hopefully um, uh, really staving off the anticipated uh, next round of, of evictions as the moratoria are lifted uh, for uh, tenants in the state. There is a separate eviction moratorium extension that the governor has included in his budget. Um, it extends rental protections uh, that were set to expire on January 31st, which is why he's asking for quick action by the legislature. Uh, under this proposal, California renters who are experiencing financial hardship uh, related to COVID-19 and pay at least 25% of their monthly rent cannot be evicted for unpaid rent. Uh, the governor is proposing that the state uh, quickly deploy also uh, $2.6 billion of uh, our share of federal rental assistance funds as an early action as well. So these two pieces are uh, really comprise uh, the assistance that um, the state and this administration wants to provide to our, our renters population and particularly some of the smaller landlords as well. Uh, there is also an equitable recovery for California businesses and jobs plan that is funded in the budget to the tune of $4.5 billion. And um, this represents the um, business and workforce recovery elements of the budget. And uh, the specific components of the plan include a small business COVID-19 uh, relief program, just a little over a billion dollars that um, would uh, uh, be uh, made available uh, in terms of uh, grants uh, that uh, would um, help uh, micro and small businesses affected by the pandemic and prioritizing regions and industries most affected by COVID-19, as well as to disadvantaged communities and underserved small business groups. And I think for many of you representing contract cities, uh, just uh, keep watch of that because this really could have uh, an amazing impact, particularly with many of the small businesses that are shuttered in your areas. Uh, the equ equitable recovery um, plan also includes a California jobs initiative uh, that is funded at just about $778 million. And it, this focuses on job creation and retention, uh, regional development, and also small business and climate innovation. Uh, the elements of this initiative is a new California competes uh, grant program that's designed to support job creation and investments in infrastructure. Uh, we're also extending uh, the Main Street Small Business Credit uh, to the tune of $100 million. So this is to uh, really encourage the hiring of new employees and the rehiring of former employees uh, by uh, businesses. Uh, there is also uh, an element that would mitigate the uh, state and local tax deduction for uh, limitation for S corporation shareholders. This is, remember, the uh, <clears throat> federal tax plan. Uh, uh, the state and local tax deduction was uh, severely uh, curtailed. And so this is a way to uh, try to help um, you know, some of those lost dollars uh, be able to get back into um, some of our, our business owners. Uh, the California Dream Fund, uh, this would seed entrepreneurship and small business creation in underserved communities. And then we have the um, small business finance centers that are uh, currently housed in the California Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank. Uh, and this, uh, these centers provide uh, small business loan and disaster loan guarantees. Um, and it's uh, funded at $50 million, which would be used to leverage about $250 million in loans uh, for uh, small businesses. 
We have a sales tax exclusion expansion uh, that is going to broaden the sales tax exclusion through a program in the treasurer's office to reduce the cost of manufacturing equipment in order to promote innovation and also meet the state's uh, climate change goal. So for climate technology and, and other types of uh, equipment. And then there's about uh, just a little under $13 million that's dedicated to a California rebuilding uh, fund capitalization. And this is being allocated um, in partnership with the legislature. And this is to fully capitalize the California rebuilding fund that uh, the legislature and the governor uh, did um, partner on lot late last year to provide low interest loans to underserved businesses. And so, you know, all this is meant to try to help businesses get back on their feet. Uh, the details of which still are being worked out about how uh, these dollars will be allocated, how they can be accessed. And so as those details become available, we'll be sure that we get some of that information uh, out to you all as well. We have uh, a workforce development um, initiative as well, which uh, proposes about $335 million to support California workers uh, using uh, proven workforce development strategies like apprenticeships and uh, high road training partnerships. And uh, these investments will also encourage uh, greater collaboration and coordination with our uh, higher education institutions as well as local workforce partners. Uh, there is a fee waiver proposal that's being funded at about $71 million, and this is for individuals and businesses most affected by the pandemic, including barbers and cosmetologists, cosmetologists, manicures, bars, and restaurants, uh, to help with um, uh, waiving the fees on uh, uh, license renewals or, or reinstituting licenses as businesses get back on their feet. As a job creator, um, and this is something I've been doing budgets for a long time, I've not seen an investment like this for a very, very long time, but $300 million in funding for deferred maintenance. Uh, this is uh, really recognizing the job creating potential of uh, infrastructure projects on state owned properties. Uh, and this funds critical statewide uh, deferred maintenance, including the greening of our state infrastructure. Uh, and this, this will also include uh, projects like the installation of electrical vehicle charging stations at state owned facilities. And then finally, uh, we have $500 million in housing uh, that uh, will uh, be provided uh, through the infill infrastructure grant program. And it's to create jobs and long-term housing to development to unlock more than 7,500 new permanent affordable homes for, for Californians. You know, when I think about all of these um, uh, proposals. Um, certainly the emphasis is on um, getting uh, assistance out to small businesses on curbing uh, the, the pandemic and uh, just uh, trying to do everything we can to be sure that uh, as uh, uh, people are, are returning back to work that there are jobs that uh, will be created. And so that was really uh, the, uh, the pillars under which this administration developed these proposals. And so what the um, governor is asking the legislature to do is to take quick action on four aspects of this budget. One is uh, the $2 billion he announced uh, a few weeks ago for school reopening. Uh, this is to uh, really prepare uh, school districts to safely uh, reopen their physical facilities uh, for uh, students to return to the school site. Uh, we know that there will be um, a lot of uh, discussion and negotiation, particularly with the uh, uh, teachers union representatives, as well as uh, school districts about uh, the readiness of uh, schools and personnel to be able to accommodate the reopening of, of school sites. Uh, the tax refunds for low-income Californians is going to require also uh, immediate action. Uh, the small business and uh, non and the small business assistance programs are also, by the way, many much of it is ap applicable to nonprofits as well. So many of our nonprofit community organizations have been uh, just so decimated by the pandemic that these are also funds that could uh, assist our nonprofit uh, community organizations as well. As well as the fee waiver program, these are the four components that the governor is seeking early legislative action uh, to get them in place before the end of the month so that we can uh, get these dollars out the door and uh, not only in the pockets of uh, low income Californians, but also to help businesses begin to plan in terms of their ability to reopen. Now, just a little bit about federal spending on California because the uh, <clears throat> The governor recently announced that he expects California to receive substantial funds from the recently um, passed federal stimulus package. And uh, <clears throat> what we hope to get is about $20 billion in unemployment assistance. Um, really important. Uh, our unemployment numbers continue to climb. And uh, we know that uh, this assistance has been um, a long time coming. 
$17 billion in direct stimulus checks of $600 to eligible Californians. We know that those are already going out the door as we speak. Uh, $2 billion in rental assistance. Um, this is on top of uh, what uh, we will be providing in our state budget. $1.3 billion in COVID-19 testing, tracing, and vaccines, um, which is uh, going to be tremendously helpful in terms of the dissemination of the vaccine and and being sure that we have venues that are located in uh, all parts of California that are accessible. Uh, about $8.5 billion for our schools and community colleges and universities, and a um, billion dollars for childcare. Now, this is one that I know we have had um, a lot of input from uh, many parts of California about the need for greater assistance for childcare and childcare workers uh, who are um, just uh, really have uh, been um, in so much demand, um, but at the same time, aren't able to continue to operate uh, their childcare services because of the pandemic. And then $2 billion for transportation. So the proposed budget subject to change throughout a months long process uh, with the legislature that the governor just proposed lays out the fiscal priorities for California in the critical months ahead. And, uh, but we should also consider as well um, the long-term impacts of the years long recovery that's before us. And so uh, as we look at the policies that the legislature and the governor will be pursuing, uh, we hope also that there's attention paid to many of our communities that have been underrepresented, underserved, and uh, really have been um, disproportionately affected uh, by COVID-19 and also the recession that we are currently experiencing. And uh, you know, I think the, the other thing that I uh, just want to end with, because I think this is uh, very, very critical, and that is, um, you know, there have been, and I'm sure you're feeling it as well, but it seems like the public health directives are um, constantly, um, it's a constant moving target. It's really one of the frustrations for our business community, but um, our local public health officials have been really on the front lines of being the experts and really charting what is happening in their jurisdictions and to issue and update directives as they see fit. And so uh, the lasting issue of how we save livelihoods uh, is really front and center. Uh, for this governor and um, you know shuttering large parts of the of our economy has resulted in uh, just rapid and growing income loss to so many Californians, millions of Californians. Uh, the pandemic also I think revealed that our old booming economy wasn't working for everyone that um, you know when that band-aid was ripped off when uh, the, the coronavirus hit, um, we now have a unique opportunity to address just years of neglect in terms of how we strengthen our economy with public investments but not only we secure our uh, survival, but also ensure equity and shared prosperity. And so this is um, one way that we can talk about uh, how we kind of future-proof our economy is uh, how do we try to remove some of these vulnerabilities that we see in our economy? And I'll just end with uh, just talking about housing for a moment. Um, housing was a crisis before the COVID-19 pandemic. It is even more of a crisis now. Uh, when we have asked Californians to shelter in place safely, uh, many Californians don't have access to safe places and, which, and affordable places in which to shelter. And so we have to confront this housing affordability crisis uh, by streamlining and financing, uh, streamlining the financing and the approval of uh, new development. It is uh, a proposal that's included in the governor's budget and uh, it's something that our office has been promoting for a very long time. Uh, we also need to be sure that we have a workforce um, ready and and uh, train to uh, be on the construction sites to build the housing that we need. And, um, and all of these are gonna require not just short-term planning, but long-term planning at the same time and creativity in terms of how we use all of our resources, our physical resources, our financial resources and our human resources. And I mentioned that because even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, prior to the great recession, uh, we saw what was happening with housing, and I know all of you are dealing with that every day, you know, where so much of the decisions are uh, right before your councils. And, and what we're seeing is uh, really now the rubber meeting the road, that uh, if we do not uh, really do something extensive with respect to adding more affordable housing units to our housing stock in California, any kind of sustained economic recovery will be that much more challenged. And so uh, we've known that, um, and now I think is the time to really put our dollars to work and, and, and even think about how we might be able to do the business of housing differently and, and more efficiently. So uh, with that, I'm gonna just um, um, end and just say thank you to all of you for continuing to serve during this critical time. 
Um, it is not easy serving in local government. Uh, my hat is off to each and every one of you. I see many friends on this on this uh, call, and uh, to which I always um, fondly say, you have a much tougher job than I do. Uh, you know the, the the realities, the lived experiences of your constituents are real, and oftentimes there are very few places to really point them uh, to uh, find assistance. And I do hope that uh, you will stay in contact so that we can uh, be sure that you get the most up to date information on many of the financial resources that will be made available through this budget, and also to talk about how we can work together as partners with our new federal administration coming in as well as uh, being sure that as we rebuild this economy that uh, there's no uh, part of California that is left behind. And uh, again, as I um, often like to say, uh, you know, the economic health of California really re is, rests on the uh, economic and financial health of every single Californian. And uh, I think that's been uh, really uh, brought to the fore with this pandemic, with this recession. And certainly as we, uh, hear and continue to see the growing outcries for uh, racial justice uh, and equity, that uh, this is about economic justice and equity as well. And uh, also no part of the state has been spared by the effects of climate change. So if we can solve to all of that uh, simultaneously, no small feat, uh, I am uh, very convinced that not only will we have rebuilt the economy, we will have rebuilt it with resiliency and the ability to sustain ourselves much better and to gird ourselves much better for whatever the next pandemic may be that uh, comes to hit us. But um, again, thank you for all you're doing and really appreciate um, the partnership we have with you. Uh, but more importantly, um, just uh, never giving up and knowing that during this time, as much as um, there can be uh, a lot of distrust and dislike of government uh, that we are here to serve and the expectation for so much of the public is that particularly during emergencies and crisis that uh, where do they look to? It is their government and local governments being uh, so much at the forefront. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you very much, our State Controller Betty Yi, for being so generous with your time with us and so thoughtful um, and all the work that you're doing. I couldn't think of a more capable person um, to be handling all the responsibilities that you have at this time. And uh, we're just so grateful that you were uh, as generous as you are with your time with us today. And thank you so thank very you, much Stacey. for being with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stacy. Virtual round of applause for Miss Yi. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Likewise. And um, I wanted to toss it back really quickly to our president who had a couple more remarks um, uh, for everyone here today. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, I just wanted to um, thank our executive uh, committee and all of our board members of Contract Cities for all the work that you do. Uh, um, it is because of your leadership that our association remains strong. And I didn't want to let this meeting go by without acknowledging all of you and thanking you for the work that you're doing. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to my colleague, Council Member Seppi Schein, who is a new council member in West Hollywood, joining Contract cities for her first event. Uh, hopefully this won't be her last. And certainly with a presentation like that, we've put a good foot forward. Um, but Sebi made history in our city as the first woman of color um, elected to our city council. And uh, she really gave a great run and we're excited to welcome her to Contract Cities. Um, so I'll, I'll kick it back to you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, to continue our meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to toss it over to um, uh, Marcel for a video. So we have a word from our sponsor as an added benefit to our associate members who haven't been able to uh, meet you all in person. We added this benefit. So please uh, uh, enjoy this. Uh, this is from Chapepi Smith. Some of you may have seen it in a past one, but uh, enjoy. Contract Cities has been there for Trapepi Smith since our inception. It was one of our first stops on the local government circuit when we were just an army of one. Today, we have 23 staff working daily to help cities communicate and, and engage. As cities have risen to the challenges of 2020, we've sought the help at each turn, from a COVID portal in Duarte, promoting alfresco dining in Paramount, celebrating community spirit in Lift Up Bonita, and letters from the mayor, Amy Wells. 
so that the Smith is working side by side with our cities to deliver for residents. Let's keep pushing forward together. My favorite part about that video is that I'm featured in it. So uh, with that, uh, back to you, Stacey. Thank you, Marcel. Um, I think we're gonna move on right now to review our um, 2021 legislative platform and housing proposal. So if you all just give me a few minutes, I'll present that um, to you right now. I think Marcel may have some slides to go along with it to keep us entertained um, through this. So. I wanted to first thank uh, Contract City staff for their continued commitment and dedication to strengthening our local control and their unwavering resilience during a pandemic to bring Sacramento to all of our homes and offices today. And while he has recently moved on, I wanted to personally thank Michael Vong for his dedication to the legislative efforts of our association and also express my gratitude to Jorge Morales for so seamlessly coming on board. Thank you, Marcel, for ensuring uh, a really successful transition for our association. I also wanted to acknowledge the steadfast leadership of President Horvath um, that has, she's provided us during this really challenging time. And of course, I wanted to express a depth of gratitude to our legislative committee and executive board for providing their experience and investing their time to help frame the 2021 legislative platform. I truly appreciate the enthusiasm, diversity, and depth of knowledge that our legislative committee provides our organization at each and every meeting. We are better because of them and their commitment to take their roles so seriously. And if you'd allow me a moment to acknowledge our legislative committee members um, that helped shape this 2021 platform. Um, we have Gustavo Camacho, Juan Garza, Dina Reed, Gary Boyer, Diana Mahmood, Steve Hoffbauer, E. Derringer, Jennifer Perez, and Charlotte Craven. Thank you all so much for your service on our legislative committee. And now moving on to the details of our legislative platform. First, we have uh, post-pandemic and economic recovery and maintenance. We support more careful alignment of the public health order requirements and their economic impact on local cities and their businesses. The more restrictive the orders, the greater the need for supporting empirical evidence that they will actually have the intended effect. We support continued statewide and federal action to assist cities in maintaining local services and pandemic relief programs for residents and businesses. Next, we prioritized housing land use development. We support solutions that reduce costs and spur development that allows for innovation and flexibility. We want flexibility for our cities to best address the needs of its community and expand opportunities to build affordable housing and transit oriented development. We also want to direct state funding to support affordable housing as well. Next, we prioritized homelessness. We support streamlined protocols and metrics to be used by homeless service providers and local agencies as well as providing accurate statistics of individuals experiencing homelessness in each of our respective communities. We support regional and city driven solutions through crisis response, mental health evaluation and homeless outreach teams. We support the expansion of conservatorship laws. Next, our priority is energy and utility. We support community choice aggregation efforts to create benefits and savings for cities, small businesses, and residents, as well as support equal treatment of bundled and unbundled utility customers. Supporting ongoing efforts to mitigate wildfire disasters through responsible brush and forestry management, including coordination between the state and local governments and our utility providers. We support efforts to expand consumer access to renewable energy, such as incentives and grants to reduce reliance on non-renewable sources. Next, we prioritized public safety. We support practical measures to balance criminal reform efforts. 
We oppose efforts to reprioritize public safety funding and programs without proper stakeholder engagement and efforts that would decrease public safety services or increase crime. And we support equitable public safety reforms that reduce liability to cities, improves public safety on the community and strengthens community relations with peace officers while also addressing concerns over excessive force and distrust of peace officers. And finally, we prioritize water. We support the preservation, protection, and access of clean water from polluted dry weather and urban runoff pursuant to each of our city's responsibility for the capture and infiltration of stormwater into local aquifers. We support practical, feasible, and affordable solutions to meet mandatory compliance of water quality and treatment standards, notwithstanding prior agreements that otherwise limit a city's ability to undertake such activities. And specifically, Contract City supports funding to address growing statewide concerns for forever chemicals, specifically exposure to PFAS and microplastics. And in addition to the work that we put forth to shape our legislative platform, our committee has also been working on developing solutions to a longstanding issue. Over the last few years, Contract Cities has been at the forefront of challenging legislation that would undermine our local control. And many of these legislative efforts would force cities to build housing through statewide mandates without any funding mechanism. In the most recent legislative session, the legislature nearly approved SB 1120, which would have required cities and counties to approve housing development projects containing two residential units on parcels zone for single family development. And as a result, Contract Cities commissioned a housing subcommittee to examine existing tools and ideas that we may have to build more housing while retaining that local control. And through our research, we came to a consensus that we actually have an affordability crisis, not a housing crisis. And thus, our subcommittee drafted language that we believe will create the necessary tools to be able to build more affordable housing while still retaining important local control. And as the bill stands today, it would do two things. It would create a housing trust fund that would potentially require state matching funds, and it would create arena exchange program. We're meeting with numerous stakeholders so that the language, the language may change through this process, but we're confident and excited at the opportunity of having a seat at the table and presenting solutions when it comes to developing affordable housing throughout each of our respective communities. Should you have any questions regarding the status of the bill or have any feedback for our subcommittee, don't hesitate to reach out to our executive director or his staff. I wanna thank you all for your time and attention. And now I'll hand it back to Marcel for some closing remarks. All right, thank you, Stacy, um, And thank you everyone for attending. Um, this, is, this concludes our first session. As I stated at the top of the meeting, we had some difficulty this week, obviously. Uh, the legislators, first they were pushed back a week. There are up in Sacramento uh, starting this week, but for the, the next three weeks, we'll be meeting on Thursday. So a week from this Thursday, we'll meet again. Same time, noon to one o'clock, we have Speaker Rendon. Uh, we have Assemblymember Kamlinger Dove, who is part of the Housing Committee. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're trying to get folks that are gonna be uh, instrumental and crucial to um, our efforts in Sacramento, although we're doing them from here for now. At some point this year, we'll, we'll be in Sacramento meeting with them in person. Uh, we'll do everything we can do to get to the folks, at least from the Southern California delegation down here. We continue the work on the housing proposal. Um, we've gotten a ton of feedback, so please stay tuned for that. We may have to make some adjustments to the language of the bill, depending on feedback we get from legislators and from uh, policy folks in there and the people that run the committees. Margaret Clark, I see you had your hand up. Did you have a question for Betty Gee? Yeah, yes, but it, it has to do, I mean, I'd like people to know, I wanted to ask her, um, I understand in the budget that the governor is um, proposing to monitor our council meetings and our planning commission meetings to ensure that we're approving housing. And I would much rather have the money that he's gonna spend on doing that to go to incentivizing affordable housing because 
as everybody knows, we don't have any tools. They took redevelopment. We don't build it. They think we're not, they think we're the problem that we're not zoning for. We zone for it, but we can't build it. Uh, and so we, they need to um, stop doing these bills that would take away our local control. The mandate SB 50, fortunately it died, but 1120 would, would uh, really hurt low income communities. I'm working uh, with some um, other cities that are um, concerned on the black community in uh, where I grew up, Baldwin Hills, uh, Shopton, Luma Park. There's 350 black homeowners that are very concerned about 1120 and those bills that would mandate um, the high, you know, right in your neighborhood, fourplexes, whatever, and gentrification, and they will lose their American dream that they worked their tails off against all the discrimination that they had. And so I'm very passionate about this, that we fight these bills and, and um, stop the governor from <laughs> spying on our meetings when we don't, we're not turning down housing. It's all luxury housing. There's nothing affordable. Anyway, I'll shut up. Sorry, thank uh, you. Th thank you, Margaret. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's one of the aspects that we're working on with the bill is we're, we're asking the uh, the legislature to or the state to put some skin in the game, to do a, a, it's one of the things we're working toward, to put some matching funds toward this, uh, this housing trust that we're working toward uh, and that way, what it does is it helps you each control that regionally. Because what, what we've heard right now from the legislature is that a lot of the funds that, or not from the legislature, just from the, the reporting out, is a lot of the funds that have been going into these, uh, and the, the housing funds uh, have been going to the larger cities, the Los Angeles, the San Diego, the San Francisco. So we want to make sure that some of that fund is earmarked specifically for regions. So the smaller cities have a chance, uh, a fighting chance at that money. So that's one of the things that we're working on. We're hopeful that uh, the, the state will see it as we do and, and realize that uh, there has to be some equitable distribution of those funds throughout cities in order for this housing uh, problem to be any kind of uh, dent in it. So thank you for that feedback, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that's it for today, guys. We'll see you next Thursday on the, let's say the 12th, 14th, the 21st. Um, please join us. Again, we have Speaker Rendon and Assembly Member Kamala Gurdav. We'll have one more confirmation. We're gonna try to have at least three speakers in and we'll, we'll fit in a little bit of time for questions for each of those if, if, uh, if we're able to. Sometimes they, they go a little bit long, but uh, thank you again for joining us. Have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week. Stay safe and healthy and we'll see you soon. Thank you.